this is the journey. And one of the things that Margaret and I like to say to each other, uh, particularly on a long haul flight, but uh, we, we say it uh, when things maybe aren't going as well as they, we planned, when we're facing a little bit of opposition, we just look to each other and we say, enjoy the journey. <laughs> because, uh, you know, I'm really showing my age now. Way back in the days when I became a Christian, we used to sing a song uh, which was every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. You know, and uh, wow, it's true, it's true. And we want to encourage you again tonight, uh, carrying on a little bit from uh, where I left off this mo morning, to, to show you the, the, the way it transitioned, because transformation starts in me as an individual. Something has to change in me, in my heart, in my understanding. Uh, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So something has to take place on a personal level. But then, the wonderful thing is, when your life is transformed by the power of God, you can see other lives start to be affected. And it starts, first of all, in your family. Now, I don't think there's anyone here that doesn't really want to see transformation happen in your family. Amen? Uh, so... Uh, we are just uh, so privileged to see uh, members of our family transformed. Uh, the, the one person who's holding out in my family is my older sister. She's nine years older than me and uh, retired. And uh, she uh, had a, uh, quite a, uh, how would you say, a, no, I wouldn't say she hated me, but it was, it was you know, because I'm your brother, she can't hate me. But it was as close as you can get to it. Uh, uh, and hated what I'd become because I was now a goody two-shoes. Oh, you're a pastor. And then, uh, uh, you know, nothing I could say seemed to assuage that anger in her. In fact, every time I tried to make peace with her, she got worse. Uh, and sometimes when we speak peace, things actually seem to get worse, not better. But that is exactly the time when we need to continue and to continue. And she was my biggest critic. She would tell me all the things that I was doing wrong. Uh, uh, and not only tell me, but she would tell as many people as she could find. How wrong I was until the day of the tsunami. And she was, uh, I think, the third person to call us to see how we were. And then when I appeared on the television, I was on the BBC News, ITV News every night, uh, 6 o'clock. We, we had a guy from Leeds who would come home uh, from work uh, and I would be on the TV and I would be doing something and, and it would normally involve pe people who were seriously injured or whatever. And there were a few, you know, they would say, uh, give a warning before they, the, the, uh, the piece came on. Uh, and he sent, he, sent, he, he sent us an envelope, and in the envelope was a £10 note. And he said, here's £10. Every night I come home, and I want to eat my dinner, and you're on, and I can't eat. <laughs> Take the money and get off the television. <laughs> so, uh, and I could, I could sense, you know, uh, what, what is my sister's reaction going to be? But in incredibly... It was the complete opposite. Because now she was saying, did you see my brother on TV last night? <laughs> did you see him on the news? And, and it was quite like she, she completely turned around. She's come closer to the kingdom in these past eight years. Uh, and she, uh, she was a school teacher. And she actually wrote uh, musicals for the children to perform on, based on Bible stories writing songs of praise to God, which are now sung in some churches. And she's not saved yet, but she's close to the kingdom. And so I say, never give up. You see, because when you, you hear someone like me tell all these stories, you think, oh, but yeah, but it's just wonderful. You know, this is fantastic. That's great for you. But you don't understand the problems I face. You see, I haven't got enough time to tell you all the bad stuff. And all the struggles that we've faced. And all the challenges that we've come against. But believe you me, we face challenges. And then you say, it's, it's, it's easy for you in Thailand. You don't live in the UK. 
And so I say, which part is easy? Having to speak Thai. Yeah? And I'm from Wolverhampton, right? Uh, or uh, uh, having to understand a different culture. Which part of that is easy? See, it's not easy. Right? It's not easy at all. But nothing is impossible. Amen? So we have to have that mindset, that mindset that all things are possible in Christ. And when we have that mindset, we'll find that, yes, it is difficult, but it's not impossible. And the extraordinary will happen because we have an extraordinary God. Amen? Praise the Lord. So if we've got the PowerPoint, that would be great. And uh, I want to share a little bit about how we walk in authority. Uh, because when we first, when I, we saw all these miracles, the miracles that would falling out the sky, uh, where we fed the 1,000 children with 700 meals, we gave them all uh, presents. We only had 700 presents, but every child had a present, and there were 200 left over. This, that was directly involving me. But what I discovered was that the congregation were watching me. They watch you, Chris, Pastor Chris. Right? They watch, they've got their eyes on you at all times. And uh, it, it's true, though. But, they, you know, I, we had uh, uh, just a little bit of a social meeting with our uh, leadership team uh, before we came to the UK. And before I knew where we were going, they were starting to uh, imitate different people. And then they started to imitate me. And they came out with all my isms. And I thought, I didn't know I had that ism, but apparently I do. Uh, and they were doing it in black country accents, which was incredible because most of them are Thai. Uh, and and it, was, it was just really weird to hear this Wolverhampton accent coming out of Thai people. Uh, uh, and phrases that I didn't realize that I obviously repeat endlessly. Uh, they were coming back to me. But you model behavior. And if you are living in the power and the authority of the Holy Spirit and you're walking out your faith on a daily basis, you model a lifestyle, a Christian lifestyle. And what I want, want to do as part of my uh, existence on this earth is to model a transformation lifestyle. And as we do that, we see that other people catch it. And other people start to do things that are extraordinary because they see you doing it. Praise God. Pressure's on now. So modeling is a very important part. I don't mean modeling, right? I mean modeling a lifestyle. Yeah? That things would be pretty desperate if I had to do the other kind, right? I mean, well, the world would run out of handsome men, they would turn to me. So, um, Margaret thinks I'm handsome, but then she's, she should. But uh, no one else should. Hallelujah. So, so, how do we walk in this authority? So, next slide. Did you know that God has more faith in you than you have in him? Do you know that? God has more faith in you than you have in him. And that's an incredible statement because God is waiting with anticipation for you to step out in his trust. Wow. God, I picture God not sitting back in his throne, enjoying the position, but I picture God sitting on the edge of his throne, looking down and looking and saying, there's my, there's my boy down there, that's my girl down there. Oh, come on, you can do it, you can do it. I believe in you. God has more faith in you than you have in him. And that's just incredible to think that he's willing us on. All things are possible. And our Heavenly Father is with us. So the next slide. What I spoke about this morning was this pattern from Luke chapter 10. This lifestyle. You see, if this becomes a method, it will not work. Uh, I've been around to so many conferences, uh, so many ways of of how to do things. Listen, when you, when you take 16 years to grow a church of 43 people, you go to every conference because there's got to be a better way than the way I'm doing it. You go everywhere. 
I've sat under Caesar Castellanos. I've sat under Reinhard Bonnke. I've sat under uh, Billy Graham. I've sat under, you name it, I've been there. And I've come back and came, okay guys, this is what we do. Still got 43 people after 16 years. What, 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 what is going on? And what I came to realize is that what I need to do is to develop a lifestyle, not use a method. Right? So our lifestyle is based on Jesus' teaching in Luke 10. And this, of course, is Ed Silvoso's teaching. Prayer evangelism, he calls it. Right? So Jesus, first of all, tells us to bless. And there is so much power in blessing. We have the authority to bless in the name of Jesus. Do not underestimate that. It seems as though saying bless you is a kind of, uh, is on the same level as hello and goodbye. Blessing people carries with it a dynamic that is supernatural. And we need to understand this. Because blessing changes the spiritual climate. And uh, I'm sure uh, you've heard this before, right? The Luke 10 thing. So I'm not going to dwell on that. So let's go on to the, the next slide because I want to say that. Speaking peace or blessing changes the spiritual climate. From being uh, a, a climate which is against us to a climate become, that becomes favorable to us. So it goes from being hostile to being favorable. Uh, and it's like in, in Thailand, uh, it's not so much a problem here, although uh, around Heathrow Airport it's a growing problem. But in Thailand we have cockroaches, right? a lot of cockroaches. Right? Uh, uh, and we have all kinds of insects and things and they're just big and they all bite. And some of them put you in hospital. Right? We, and we have the, even the little ones like mosquitoes. Right? So we, we have a lot of insect spray. And we've always got at least 10 cans. We've got a, a can of insect spray in every house, every room in the house. Right? So uh, we can just quickly get the spray and pssst, gone. Right? Uh, and when you introduce an insect to this spray, it doesn't die immediately, but it's kind of just ooh, starts going like that and, and runs. A, just, it gets faster. Right? But it, it's getting faster because it's, it's being dealt with. You know, it's it's going to die. And... Um, when you speak peace and blessing, it's like you're spraying insect spray on the demons. Right? And it's, it's, you know, it pushes them back. It causes them to go into a bit of a frenzy. So at first it may seem as though their activity is increasing. But it's panic. It's panic. Because, hang on a minute, these Christians are getting a bit volatile now. These Christians are doing things that we don't want them to do. They're starting to speak peace over their neighbours, over their families. They're speaking blessing over their communities. You see, we know about the book of Ephesians and we read the book, uh, chapter 6 and we know that it says that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, put on the whole armour of God. And, and we look at that chapter and we say, okay, this is what we've got to do, guys. But we don't read ch verse, uh, chapters 1 to 5. And chapters 1 to 5 is all about unity. And the thing that arms principalities, the thing that arms these spiritual forces that are arrayed against us in our communities, is disunity. And blessing brings people together. Jesus said, bless and do not curse. Don't complain. I, I, you know, people ask me, what, what do you notice about the, the British when you come home? Right? So... Right, I am one. I'm a Brit, right? Born and bred, Burton, Anglo-Saxon name. I've been around a long time. No, I wasn't actually an Anglo-Saxon, but my ancestors were. Right? I'm not that old. Uh, so, yeah, I am a British. And you know what? We're a nation of complainers. Yeah? We get enthusiastic. For at least a week in the World Cup, when the World Cup's on. Right? All the flags are out. Right? The flags everywhere. And like two minutes after we lose to Germany, all the flags have disappeared. 
And so we don't want to be British anymore. Take all the flags down. We're not English again until the next four years and they all come out again. And, and we, we have this expectation, but then we have this ability to complain. Wow. You see, we need to be people who are a blessing, not people who complain. Amen? And, and I tell you, I hear complaints in the church. And we travel around a lot. We hear a lot of church. And, 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 and people are complaining about this, complaining about that, complaining about whatever. Even during the worship, they say, oh, yeah, oh, isn't it terrible about this? Let's just pray. Now let's worship God. What? <laughs> We're kind of quite the two together. Wasn't worship great tonight? Yeah? Aren't we still in that, that atmosphere as we are entered into his gates? And, and we need to recognize that and we, so we speak peace. We are cutting against the norm. And one of the things we need to recognize that when you are involved in transformation, you're on the cutting edge. Because you're bringing something that is missing. You're bringing something that is powerful and you need to recognize who you are in Christ. That God has faith in you. And you are a child of God and in the name of Jesus all things are possible. So I can walk in that authority and I can speak peace and even the demons will obey. Right? They have no choice. Can anyone tell me how many times the devil has won against God? Zero. Right? That's worse than Wolverhampton Wanderers. <laughs> right, not that wolves have beaten God, but, uh, but they have at least won a game. Two, in fact, this season. Really. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> the devil has won. Zip! Right? He loses every time. He is a born loser. Right. Hallelujah. That makes us, because we're on the other side, that makes us born again winners. Amen? So you, look, this is, the, this is all written down and, you know, check it. It's in a book. It's called the Bible. Right? We win. Right? I, I, I like to read books where the hero wins, you know. I just always check the last page. See if he's still alive. If he's not, and I'm not interested. Well, I mean, you, people who kill off the hero, forget it. I don't want to know it. Right? The hero, okay, he wins at the end. I'm going to do it, you know? So, James Bond's great because he always wins, right? <laughs> he only lives twice, but he's, still, but he's there again, right? You know, so, so, praise God. So, we win. So, are you starting to get the picture of who we are? So, okay, let's carry on. Next, next slide. So, this is the day after we f fed. The thousand children. And I go 200 kilometers north to a refugee camp. 5,000 people in the refugee camp. And we meet this lady. Right? Now, she, you won't know her, but she's actually Miss Thailand 2004. Miss Thailand 2004. So she's in the camp. I didn't know who she was, but all the ties with me are going, it's Miss Thailand. <laughs> and, and they're all sort of frothing at the mouth. And, uh, and I don't really know. I think, is there... They've been bitten by a rabid dog or something. But, and I'm not quite sure what's going on, why they're getting so excited. But I'm talking to this lady. Uh, and let me tell you guys, if you're going to mix with people like Miss World or Miss Thailand or Miss UK or anything like that, make sure you're married to Miss World first. Amen. Hallelujah. Uh, and so uh, she says to me, look, I've got 200 children at this camp and they've got nothing. I say, hang on a minute. In my truck, with the winch on the front, <laughs> Russ was listening to me this morning. I said, I've got a, tr a truck with a winch on the front. Everyone knows what I am. Russ heard witch. <laughs> so he thought, I, I deal very severely with the servants of the enemy. I tie them to the front of the truck, <laughs> and drive them around. So, winch, Ross, winch. Right. <laughs> so, all the presents were in, 200 presents that we had left over were in the truck. So, we gave these presents out to the 200 children at this refugee camp. 
it just so happened, right? Or, as the Bible puts it, it came to pass. Or, as Pastor Chris puts it, suddenly, <laughs> right? A cavalcade pulled up and out got one of the Thai government ministers, the Minister of Social Welfare. He was visiting the camp. And he comes and he recognizes Miss Thailand. And he said, uh, who's in charge here? And she said, no one. He said, how many people here? She said, 5,000. 5,000 homeless people. All sitting in a field. And uh, that's bad news in Thailand because it's really hot. And it was the hot season. And, and so... He said, well, I want you to be in charge. He says, well, this is just too much for me. And he looked at me. So he says, and who are you? <laughs> so I said. <laughs> now, Miss Thailand actually says, she said, oh, this is uh, Pastor Brian. He's from Phuket. And so, uh, uh, and he's been helping with the children. So he says, okay, the two of you are now in charge of this camp. So I'm thinking, ah, ah, just, ah, whoa, hang on a minute. I had 50, uh, 43 people. Then we prayed and we saw wood fall out the sky and I got another 120. Then we pray over meals and they expand. You know, Big Macs and plastic toys. Two fish, five loaves, same thing. And then the next day, I'm in charge of 5,000 people. What's going on? This is, this is God. And I feel very uncomfortable. And of course, Ed Silvaso's teaching doesn't help you one bit. Right? Because he says, get comfortable being uncomfortable. <laughs> well, is that supposed to console me? <laughs> is that supposed to make me feel good? Get comfortable being uncomfortable. Because we like to be comfortable, don't we? Especially in the West, we've got everything instant. We like to be comfortable. But I want to tell you that when you get on this train of transformation, get comfortable being uncomfortable. Because God will ask you to do uncomfortable things. Because we were talking about this earlier, a price has to be paid. A price has to be paid. But is it worth it? Yeah. Is it worth it, Margaret? Yeah. Price has to be paid. It came to the point where... Uh, after we'd been engaged in this intense spiritual warfare, that I went to see a doctor because I didn't feel well, and he gave me two weeks to live. And so he says, you better get your estate ready and your family ready because you'll be dead in two weeks. And I, so I said, God, what do you think? He said, God said, nah. <laughs> so that was good enough for me. God said, nah. Not going to happen. That was two and a half years ago. Hallelujah. I'm better now. Actually, my last checkup, I'm better now than I've been for, the past, for 15 years. My health. Praise the Lord. God's good. So, yeah, it will cost because you've got to put in. Yeah? Our salvation is free, isn't it? Cost Jesus everything. Cost God his son. Yeah? And if we want to see that blessing carried on through us to the community, we've got to be ready to pay the price. But the journey is wonderful. The journey is exciting. It might not be what, you've actually, what you would have written down, but I tell you what, it's better than what you could think or imagine. So, next slide. So, I mean, I'm in charge of this camp. Uh, and we are involved in uh, taking uh, people uh, and rehousing them. Uh, I met a guy this morning, Chris, who was actually involved in supplying a thousand houses for, so, for, a thou for some of these people that we actually put in. And, and, and I didn't know him. Didn't know me until he came and we talked to him this morning. Isn't that amazing? Uh, that we were involved together, but we didn't know. Isn't God amazing? How he brings people together 
And, and he has resources that you don't know about. And you think, how could I possibly do this? How could I possibly build a school? Don't worry, King of Thailand's going to help. Don't worry, the army's going to help. Don't worry, the TV media are going to help. I don't know any of these people. Don't worry, David Moyes will come. Unbelievable. And I blessed him. And now look, he's the manager of Manchester United. Well, God's blessed him. <laughs> Hallelujah. So we ended up doing that. Next slide. So we managed to get all these children out. What time do I finish, by the way? <laughs> oh, okay, that's dangerous. No, I'll be, I'll be reasonable. I'll be reasonable. Don't worry. And uh, we rehoused all these people, and the camp was closed down, and we thought, okay. And, and eventually, after about two years, life kind of got back to normal. And, and I, I was invited to open the new Starbucks that had been rebuilt and stuff like that. It started to get a bit more comfortable, right? Starbucks was much better than some of the other stuff I had to do. Uh, and uh, about five years went by. And uh, we, I was driving along from, with a friend of mine from Wales who was with us. And I said, that's where the camp used to be. So I'll, I'll go and take you where it, where it uh, used to be. And we got there and we discovered that there were 300 people still there five years later in the temporary wooden shacks that had been put up. And nothing had been done to help them. I was shocked because I thought, well, I, I was certain we'd helped everyone. But there's 300 people still not, uh, it didn't work out. Actually, they went to get homes which were promised and there weren't enough and they just came back. And um, this lady here, uh, she's uh, known around the world now. She's uh, the ice cream lady. And uh, I, said, uh, I said to her, can you go to this village and, and kind of help them out? And uh, my football team, Wolves, look, had, had sent me 3,000 shirts. Right? You know how much a football shirt costs, right? So near enough 100 pounds, right? 80, 80 to 100 pounds. They sent me 3,000. Hallelujah. Praise God. Gave them, that gave 3,000, 1,000 shirts for every year in the Premier League. <laughs> and... Uh, and so we had these shirts to give out, which was great, really, because whenever I went up and we had a, a, a service with them, they thought that the shirts we'd given them were church uniform. <laughs> and so it was, for me, it was like going to a game. Because right? I walk into church and then all these wolf supporters, I was, whoa, this is heaven. Right? <laughs> this is really great. And... Uh, and so I taught them a new chorus. And, and I taught them, ole, 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 ole. Jesus, Jesus. Right. So uh, <laughs> it's really good. And, and I, I got them doing all this kind of stuff while they were worshipping and just imagined. And um, this, this is incredible because uh, Wanapa, the ice cream lady, was the only person, the only miracle we'd ever witnessed in the first 16 years when we built up to 43 people. She was dying of cancer and uh, I got a letter from uh, the Thai social services saying there's this uh, uh, young girl, which is the, this girl here. At the time I got the letter, she was 10. And she'd written a letter to social services saying that my mum's dying. Can you come and help me? I'm the girl selling fried bananas by the side of the road in this little village. So they, they said, well, we don't know what to do. We can't do anything. So we'll give it to that English guy. So I got the letter. So we went to find the little girl, found her selling bananas. I mean, they took us to this little shack. And uh, the ice cream lady was lying on the floor. She wasn't the ice cream lady then. She used to be a spirit medium. Uh, and she was lying on the floor in a pool of her own blood, and she got hours to live, riddled with cancer. So we prayed with her, and I didn't, I didn't really know what to say. I thought, boy, you know, I mean, we've got to literally pull her back from death. Maybe if we get her saved, then she can go to heaven. And uh, 
And then the word of the Lord came to me. And I just started to say, silver and gold have I none. But what I have in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And she got up, completely healed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now that's fantastic. But that was one miracle in 16 years. And it came to like 10 years afterwards and we were still referring back to that moment. Right? Now, I've got to tell you now that we don't do that anymore. Well, I've just done it, haven't I, actually? Um, but the, the point is that miracles happen every day. Right? It, we shouldn't be looking back to an event. We should be living out the power of God on a daily basis. And we can only do that when we learn to who we are in Christ and we walk in authority. And so the ice cream lady, we asked her, what do you do? So I channel evil spirits into people. I said, well, you know, as you're giving your life to Christ, you can't do that anymore. <laughs> so she kind of agreed. And says, well, what can you do? So, well, I'd like to sell things. So what would you like to sell? She said, ice cream. So we bought her. In fact, in England and Thailand sell walls ice cream. So we bought her a Walls ice cream cart that you push. And, and she started to sell Walls ice cream. And she would sell it around the villages. And everywhere she went, every person she sold ice cream to, she would tell them, I'm alive because Jesus healed me. And she did that for 10 years. And in that whole period of 10 years, thousands of people heard this incredible testimony and not one person came to Christ. Whoa. But then, I got transformed. And I started to live a lifestyle of prayer evangelism. And I modeled that lifestyle of prayer evangelism to Wan Lapa, the ice cream lady. And she started to speak peace. Before she entered a village, she would speak peace over the village. Then she would go, and with her ice cream, she would get to know the people. She would build up trust with those people. And they would have fellowship with her. And they started to share with her their felt needs. And as they shared their felt needs, she would say, Do you mind if I pray for you? If they were hungry, she said, Would you like an ice cream? Free of charge. Because I had to buy the ice creams to fill the cart anyway, so it was okay by her. She didn't mind. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, so, so she, would do, she would do this. And then she would introduce them to the kingdom of God. And in the last four years, this 62-year-old lady has led one and a half thousand people to Jesus. Hello. I tell you that we've got church of 43. What I haven't told you is that we've got over 4,000 now. Uh, that's the ones we know. Because we actually, uh, there are places where we have meetings I haven't even been to yet. Because they're everywhere. And I don't exactly know how many people go to those meetings. So we have a conservative estimate of 4,000 people. But it could be as many as 10,000 people in the church. Praise the Lord. So, and that is actually her leading her own daughter to Jesus. And I'm there with the camera, just watching it go on. You see, because we model it to someone else, what, what happens is someone, a 62-year-old, uneducated uh, demon channeler, challen uh, channeler, that's right, uh, becomes the greatest evangelist in the history of Thailand. Wow. And now she's world famous. Right? But... She still does the same thing. She doesn't sell ice cream anymore. We actually made her a pasta. We thought we'd better because she's led more people to the Lord than anybody else has. <laughs> so it's pasta one la par now. But she's all known everywhere as she goes. She's known as the ice cream lady. She speaks at conferences and all kinds of things. It's incredible. Uh, and, and yet it's just simple faith. And she, uh, on, her, on her mobile phone, she has the governor's phone number. She has the mayor's phone number. Wait for it. One day she comes to me and she said, do you think the prime minister needs to know about transformation? 
So I said, yes, of course. Do you think the Prime Minister needs to be blessed? Yes, you should pray and bless the Prime Minister on a daily basis. So she walked, left, left the church and went to the bus station, got on the bus, went to Bangkok overnight, 18 hours on the bus, went to Parliament, wait, went to the government building, got, eventually got access, they wanted to see the Prime Minister, waited outside the Prime Minister office for 10 hours. People kept on looking to see if she was still there. She just waited. Eventually got 15, well, she got, she was going to be given a minute to talk to the Prime Minister. So she goes into the Prime Minister uh, and the Prime Minister said, what do you want? She said, I don't want anything. So well, what have you come for? So I co- I've come to bless you. I don't want anything from you. And the Prime Minister said, I've never met anyone who doesn't want anything from me. You want to bless me? I said, yes. We realize you've got a, uh, a difficult job. We want to speak God's peace and blessing over you. The Prime Minister knelt down in her office. Prime Minister Ying Lak Shinawat, if you, you know, any of you know Thai politics. Probably not one of your favorite subjects. Um, but she knelt down in her office and uh, Wan Lepa called me. Well, I didn't know this was going on. I answered the phone. Hi, Wan Lepa, what is it? Where are you doing? How many people are you leading to the Lord today? <laughs> right. uh, because I know when she rings me up, she's probably led 50 people to Jesus or something like that. And she said, I'm in the Prime Minister's office. I said, what? <laughs> <laughs> can it, can it, you know, <laughs> to say that again. I said, I'm in the Prime Minister's office. I'm just praying for you. Would you like to pray, pray a prayer for the Prime Minister? And now she's got the Prime Minister's phone number on speed dial. <laughs> uh, and and several t- sometimes when we know there's a national crisis going on, I've been with her and she said, let's call, let's, I said, let's call the Prime Minister. So she speed dials and she puts it on... Uh, the speakerphone, so I can hear what's going on. Uh, and uh, you hear the, uh, the secretary of the prime minister answer the phone, uh, and, uh, she sa- and she says, oh, it's Pastor Wan Le Bar. And they will get excited, you hear the prime minister go, and you hear the prime minister of Thailand, shh, right? Don't record this. Okay. You hear the prime minister of Thailand going, Woo! <laughs> and, and she prays for her on the phone. Hallelujah. She's not a Christian yet, but she's near to the kingdom. Hallelujah. Isn't that incredible? 62 years of age. Actually, 60 when she starts a ministry, real ministry, praying peace and speaking peace and seeing all these people coming into the kingdom. And God is just using her incredibly. Just an ordinary person. She cannot, she could not come up and give you Uh, a biblical uh, dissertation based on the Greek. She told she can do to read the Thai. She she wasn't, she stopped her education at 12. She reads the Bible very carefully and slowly. Sometimes she has to ask, what does this word mean? And yet, she's powerful in God. Amen? Amen? The next slide. So here's some more. You know, this is another match. <laughs> right, some of the, the folks there. So these people were homeless. So what's the felt need of the homeless? Oh, you don't need rocket science, do you? A degree for this one. Right, they need somewhere, a home of their own. So uh, what we did was, the next, next slide, we bought a piece of land. Oh, no. Uh, ooh, we've gone out of sync. We bought a piece of land, okay, and uh, we um, built a village. And uh, we didn't just say, okay, you can live here. This is our land. You can live on it and, you know, for as long as you like kind of thing. We actually divided all the properties up, got a title deed for every property, and we gave the title deed to the person and said, this now belongs to you. It's your land, your house. No one can take it away from you. It's yours. Hallelujah. Doesn't belong to us, belongs to them. Right? The whole village became Christians. And you can guess what the criticism I got. People said to me, They've only become Christians because you've given them a house. And you know what I said? Absolutely. (laughs) 
Absolutely. What's wrong with that? Right? I'm not bribing them. I'm giving it to them. It's theirs. I'm not asking them to do anything. No one has become a Christian because they're forced to. They become a Christian because they've been blessed. And everyone else could have done it. But we did it. Because it's the God thing to do. It's not the natural thing to do. And so, yeah, I say absolutely. They become Christians because we bless them. And uh, said, so said, but they're not really Christians. They don't really believe. So, okay, okay. Can you go back one? On the slides. Okay. So this is one of the ladies who lives in that village. Her name is Um. Turn to the person next to you and say, Um. Right? Now you'll remember the name. This is Um. Right? Now, Um had been a Christian for one week. And there she is, sat in her house. And um, Um was pregnant, seven months pregnant. And she had a very uh, a serious motorbike accident. She was rushed, rushed to the local clinic. So in that area, they don't have a hospital. So they rushed to the clinic, and the, uh, the medics there uh, examined her and checked her, no broken bones, few cuts and bruises, you're okay, but... We've scanned your baby, and your baby is dead. And they said, we've got to wait three days before the surgeon comes from Phuket to have the baby removed. Well, her body started to reject the baby almost immediately, and she was in incredible pain. And, and she comes back to the village, and uh, I uh, was there, and I go and I pray for her, and she's just in intense pain. And I pray for her and nothing happens. So um, I have to go back to Phuket. I say, well, we're going to pray. But the ice cream lady goes up the, uh, two days later. And by that time, this lady is in agony. And, and, and just screaming in pain all day long. And they're supposed to have a worship meeting, a worship, a worship at the start of the service. And... Uh, one of the says, Look, we can't, how can we worship God when our, our sister is in intense pain like this? So she gets all the people in the village together and they start to pray for her. And they intercede and they pray in the name of Jesus. And all of a sudden, Um says, the pain has stopped. And she stands to her feet and she says, I can feel the baby moving. So she goes, she's due to go then to the hospital to have the baby removed by the surgeon. She gets to the hospital, and the surgeon says, what on earth are you here for? There's nothing wrong. They scan the baby. The baby's perfect. And, and the, in the hospital, they said, the, the machine must have been wrong. It must, it must have been broken. And so I said, have you had it fixed? And they said, no. So I said, well, how could it have been broken then? Right? And so, they, but they were maintaining there must have been some kind of error because the baby's alive. But she, um knew, right? My baby was dead and now my baby's alive. You see, our God is that great that he raises the dead before they're born. That's pretty extraordinary, right? And so, she, but she's, she's a bit, you know, the doctors are saying no and I know that God has done this. So she's leaving the clinic when she sees the husband of her best friend. And she says, oh, it's nice of you to come here. Where's my best friend? She said, he said, oh, I'm not here for you. He said, your best friend, she's in the intensive care unit. She's just had an accident. A, a 10-wheeler truck ran over her. And she's not expected to live out the, the, the night. So Um goes in. She's been a Christian for a week. We haven't taught her how to pray yet. Right? So, so, but that doesn't matter, isn't it? It's a communication to the God who has raised her baby from the dead. Right? You can't teach that. This is a God thing. So she goes into the intensive care unit. She lays her hand on 
a, a friend. And she says, God, you did it for my baby. Now you do it for my friend. Thank you. Amen. <laughs> She's learned amen. And a friend opens her eyes. And within 10 minutes, they're both walking out the door of the hospital. And she turns back to the doctor and says, was the machine broken? <laughs> Hallelujah. So now this village, we need to name it. We built a village. The government said, give it a name. So I said to the people, what should we call the name? They said, well, there's only one name appropriate, really. We, so it's Miracle Zone Village. Ban Kate Asajan in Thai. Miracle Zone Village. Praise the Lord. Because miracles happen there. The dead are raised in that village. Not just that one. Another, another guy, they brought a guy in a coffin. As soon as he entered the village, he got out of it. <laughs> had, enough of, had enough of that. Don't like that hotel. It's a bit too cramped. <laughs> Next slide. And so we, we dedicated little baby miracle. Right? And, and because it was Miracle Zone Village, there was another baby at the same time, this baby here. And so they named that baby Zone. <laughs> doesn't, it doesn't sound too bad in Thai, actually, because Zone in Thai is Kate. Right? Uh, but it's not a great name for a guy. Um, <laughs> so it's uh, Asajan and Kate, or Miracle and Zone. Fantastic. So that's the name of the village. So go on, moving on to the next slide. So now we see we're, trans, uh, we're, we're changing the, uh, it's a slow process, we've got to raise the support, raise the money, but little by little we're building brick houses for them. They already own the land, they own the wooden houses, now we're building brick houses for them to live in. Uh, those two houses there uh, and all those people live in those two houses and uh, it's Christmas so they've all got red on. They're not changed to support Manchester United. They, it's Christmas, right? So you can see the hats, right? They've got the Santa hats on. So um, this uh, is an ongoing process. It's one of the projects that we've got. So the next slide. See, so this is the Christmas party. We've just done that photograph, and then I come to the tent. And they've invited the village, have uh, invited the chief of police, which is this guy here, and the senator for the area to come along to the village. And so they want to talk to me. So, uh, okay, fine, this is great. And they come and they said, you know, this is amazing. This village is the model village. This is the police fight over this village. <laughs> I said, well, what do you mean? They want the duty to come and because they go around the villages. They want to come to this village because there's no trouble. Right? And when they come, they can sit down and have a little bit of uh, um, fried rice and, and, you know, have a drink and, and relax and chat to the people. They love it. And, and, and whoever gets the, uh, the opportunity to come, you know, they, they feel, oh, yeah, I'm going to Miracle Zone Village today. The police, and they love the atmosphere. And so they're there to come to ask me. They said, could you do the same in some other villages? <laughs> so I said, well, you do know the reason is because they of their faith in Christ. You do know that. And they said, yes, but we're willing for, that, for you to do that. So I said, okay, right? This is in a land that's 96% Buddhist, 4% Muslim. So you can work on the percentages there the Christians we're not even a percent so I said how many villages are we talking about he said well give or take 10 20 around about a thousand <laughs> what help <laughs> a thousand that's off the chart how can we do that and God just said to me just do it one village at a time but now the door is open before it was closed now it is open Amen? And that's what God does. You see, God has given us keys. See, this is my car key. Well, it's not my car. I've rented it. But this is the car key, right? And, and we have been given keys. Keys of the kingdom of heaven. Yeah? Keys of the kingdom belong to us. But most of the time, our keys are in our pockets. We have them, but we don't use them. 
right? If I want to get in the car, it doesn't matter how long I look at it, even if I smile with an irresistible smile. It doesn't matter what I do, the only way that door is going to open is if I get the key out and I press the button and the lights flash to tell me that I can now gain access. That I can open the door, I can get in the car, I can open the little thing and stick it in the hole and the engine starts. It's only going to happen when I take the keys and use them. And this is the authority we have. To take the keys of the kingdom. You see, the only thing the devil has is gates. The gates of hell, right? He's got gates. But the the bad news for the devil is, they're locked and I've got the key. (laughs) Right? So the devil's there and he's trying to get through the gates. And I say, "Mm, sorry, they're locked today. And then an even worse day for the devil is the day when I come and I say, "Uh, excuse me, I'm coming in there. Because I want to push those gates back a bit. I want to reclaim something that Jesus has redeemed. Amen. But we need to use the keys. That's the authority we have. But we normally just keep them in the pocket and let them fester in there. Praise the Lord. Next slide. And so what happened then was the ice cream lady... Uh, rec- uh, heard that there was actually a maximum security prison quite near to Miracle Zone Village. And no one is allowed in. They don't have visitors. They put in petty crime, p- petty criminals with murderers. Men with women. And when you're 12, you're old enough to go into that prison. If you're not 12, between 5 and 12, you actually have a juvenile prison. Five-year-olds are put in prison in Tyler. And uh, so, she stands before the gates. And she raises her hands. And she starts to speak peace over the gates of the prison. Because God's told her to do it. She didn't know what's going to happen. But after 10 minutes, the gates open. And they ask, what are you doing? (laughs) And so she tells them. So they said, we better come in then. And they give her access to the prisoners. And on the first day, she goes in to speak to the prisoners. And remember, there's all these different kinds of folks in there. Some shouldn't be there. But some are murderers. And gang members, mafia members. And she stands and she just speaks to them about God's love and why she's there. And on the first day, 200 of them come to Christ. Hallelujah. And so we started the church in the prison. That's uh, me preaching to, these are all in for drug offenses. So, uh, next slide. Incredible things happen. Right. Now, the most corrupt group of people in Thailand are the police. That's amazing, isn't it? Because they're not... The Thai government hasn't got enough money to support the work of the police, so they get it in other ways, by taking bribes. Uh, And so how do you reach out to a corrupt group of people? And believe you me, there are corrupt groups in the UK. How do you reach out to them? Exactly the same way as you reach out to anyone else. right? Because they have felt needs. So you start by speaking peace. So I said uh, to uh, the ice cream lady, I said, go and see the chief of police and uh, tell them we're going to throw a Valentine's Day karaoke party for the police. Because ties like karaoke. So uh, we did, and and the police came, and this is Margaret Mee with the Deputy Chief of Police for Phuket and his wife. Uh, And we have this karaoke party, the police are singing all these songs, and there's a a couple of hundred folks from church there as well to give a kind of a spiritual mix and to change the spiritual atmosphere. And they're they're told, pray. While you're in in this place, pray. Speak peace. 
and change the spiritual atmosphere. So I'm speaking to this guy over the dinner table. And I ask him, eventually I ask him, what's the felt need of the police force in Phuket? He says, well, over the past 10 years, the population has increased from, uh, from, from 200,000 to 1 million people. But the number of police has stayed the same. And he said, I've been talking to the commissioner from, from Bangkok about the problem, and he says there are no finances available. You'll have to make do with what you've got. We can't have any more police officers. So I said, do you mind if I pray and ask God to help you with this problem? And he said, I'll take help from anywhere. Desperate people. Right? Because that was his need, not my need. I know, well, I want to tell you your need, you need Jesus. Right? But that's not his felt need. You, you, you with me on, on this? What he wants to know is, does God care about me enough to meet my felt need? And I'm there to say, yes, he does. And I'll prove it. That's the odd bit. Right? So we stood up and we prayed for him. I got the microphone off one guy, one policeman who was in the middle of a song. And, and we started to pray. And we asked God, I said, within a week. And you could see all the folks from church going, oh, he's, here we go again. What's he getting us into? I said, within a week, Lord, demonstrate your power and show our brother that he loves him and he loves the police. Well, already blown away by the fact that we've invited them because no, everyone hates the police. And here we are, give it, throwing them a party. So they're always, we're already weird people in their eyes. You know, why would you do this? And uh, so they go. A few days passed by, about three days, I think, and I got a phone call. And he said, Pastor Brian, he said, uh, you wouldn't believe what's happened. I said, well, why? What's, what's happened? He said, well, I've just heard from the commissioner in Bangkok. And he said, they've got funds available for us to uh, recruit more police officers. So I said, well, that's fantastic. What, 10, 20, 30, 50, how many? And he said, are you sitting down? So I said, yeah, I'm sitting down. He said, 7,000 Wow. The police force, because of prayer, has now been increased by 7,000 officers. And a new police station because they wouldn't fit in the old one. Wow. The following Sunday, without any invitation, he sat right in the front row of church. And we start worship and we play, you know, playing some Christian songs, you know, I sing of your love forever, that kind of stuff. And he's got his arms, he's going, right? And he's singing the songs. And at the end of the meeting, he comes to me, he says, Pastor Brian, he says, Christian karaoke is the best. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you can't make this stuff up, can you? I mean, it's crazy. <laughs> and, and, you know, he, this is before he's saved. So he comes near to the kingdom and we, we, we pray with him and he gives his heart to the Lord, the devil then mind comes and starts to stir it up. And he gets promoted. And you think, oh, that's great, to another province. Where there's no transformation church, where there's no one that's walking in this kind of way. But, and, and, and you get a bit worried, a bit concerned. Are we going to lose him? More now. Because of what he's seen God do. Right? A couple of years go by and I get a phone call from him. And he says, Pastor Brown, do you know where I am? I said, no. He said, I'm in Bangkok. I said, well, what are you doing there? He says, I'm the deputy commissioner for the whole nation. I said, Whoa. I said, praise God. He said, do you know what? He says, my next promotion, I will be the commissioner of the entire police force. And that is when the kingdom of God will come to the Thai police. Wow. He says, don't limit God and what he can do. But as we saw this morning, you have to be obedient. But don't underestimate the authority that you carry. And what other people will do when you model that lifestyle. So, next slide. How old do you have to be? 
in our church five. Right? This is the Catholic school in Phuket. Right? And these are five-year-olds on their daily prayer walk around the school. One of our ladies, who was just a house, she was a housewife. She was not just a housewife. Housewife is a very important role. But she, uh, she said, I really feel like God is asking me to go to the Catholic school and to volunteer to help there. So I said, okay, that's great. So she went there and she said, can I volunteer to help in the kindergarten class? So they said, well, actually, we don't have anybody in the kindergarten class at all. Could you come and, and you know, every day? So this is great. So she goes and she's working with the kids and she says, uh, do you mind if I, you know, teach them to pray and that kind of thing? And they said, well, yeah, you know, what, what kind of prayer? It's a bit weird because we're Catholics. And she said, no, no, it's just a prayer of blessing. They said, well, that's okay. So she teaches them to, to uh, how to do prayer evangelism. And they saw that every morning, the five-year-olds walk around the school, speak peace over all the classrooms. And after this has been going on for a few weeks, I get a phone call, and it's the Catholic priest. And he says, what are you doing in our school? I said, I don't know. What are we doing in your school? And he says, well, the children... He says, the school has just changed. The atmosphere in the school has changed. He says, I used to have to expel one student at least once a week. He said, well, I haven't expelled anybody. I said, well, isn't that good? He says, yeah, but it's weird. (laughs) He says, what are you doing? The children are praying. The children are doing their homework. The children are listening to the teachers. What's going on? And I said, have you got a Bible? He says, yeah, and I say, I know yours is bigger than mine, but I think Luke's in there somewhere. <laughs> so I said, turn to Luke chapter 10, read it, and call me back. So he did, and he called me back, and he said, this is amazing. I said, yeah, it's Luke chapter 10. He says, yes, it's in there. I said, yeah, this is wonderful. So the end result is now that the kids, are, this is a daily thing in the school, that the kids prayer walk the school. Now they have a special prayer time where parents bring in prayer requests. And that's, that's what this is. They get the prayer requests and they go to the top part of the school and they reach out and they, first of all, they bless the city. Then they start to pray for these prayer requests. And parents are getting healed in their homes with the children, the five-year-olds and above now, praying from the school. Wow. Right? And you know what I got criticized on? But they're Catholics. Oh, give me a break. Right, what part of the miracles don't you, the five-year-olds praying, don't you like? Right? I mean, this is crazy. What, so what? God loved the world. You didn't say, I only love the Protestants. Oh, man alive. That's one of the things that they say I say. Man alive. The ties take me off. Man alive. Uh, okay, so praise God. Even five-year-olds can get it. 62-year-olds can get it. It's got nothing to do with age. It's got nothing to do with ability. It's got everything to do with a heart that says yes to God. And a commitment to live a lifestyle, not apply a method. Oh, we do church on Sundays. No, you don't. You live for Jesus 24-7. Amen? I know you already know that. Hallelujah. Next slide. I think I'll finish. I'll finish with this one. Hallelujah. Wow. There's a time got. Yeah, I'll finish with this one. This lady's name is Grandma. That's her name. We call her Grandma. Right? And this is her granddaughter, and her name is Tengon. Right? That's a little bit more difficult. It took me 25 years to learn how to pronounce that. Right? Tengon. And uh, so, Grandma, she's a sea gypsy. And how she earns a living every day is by catching worms. She's a professional worm catcher. And she does it by simulating rain. And the worm pokes his head up and she grabs it. Now you might think, well, that's easy. (laughs) No, it isn't. I tried to do it. I ended up falling over, falling backwards, doing everything. But I I never ended up with a worm. 
It's, it's, some, it's a skill she's learnt. And she's really good at it. She catches a kilo of worms, and in exchange for a kilo of worms, she gets around about 20 pence a day. And with 20 pence, she can buy a pound of pig fat. And that's what her family eats. That's her life. Every day, up early in the morning, catching worms to get the kilo, gets the pig fat, cooks the meal, go to bed, wake up. That, that was life. We can't suddenly comprehend how a lot, most of the people in the world actually live. But anyway, when the power goes to the hospital, prays for someone in the hospital, they get healed, that comes from this village, goes back to the village, and instantly about 120 people get saved. So now she's in church. Grandma's a member of this village, so she's... She's saved. And um, Tengorn gets sick. She thinks she's got a bad cold. Now, in Thailand, if you've got a cold or a cut finger, you've got a hospital. Right? It's just the way they are. Oh, we're, we're sick. We're dying. Right? They've got a hospital. Right? Here, you're cold. You're expected to go to work. Right? But in Thailand, you, you take a week off. You sneezed once. That's it. I'm sick. So, um, so they take her to the hospital, and she's admitted to the hospital in the morning, and grandma says, I'll come back after I've caught the worms, got the pig fat, cooked the food for the family, I'll come and see you. So later that afternoon, she turns up to the hospital, uh, where, goes into the room where Tang On should be, and the bed's empty. So she asks the nurse, where's Tang On? And she says, oh, I'm sorry, she had pneumonia. She died two hours ago. She's in the morgue. Well, grandma can't believe this. She goes down to the morgue and she sees Tang On out on the slab and she's being injected with formaldehyde to preserve the body. And so she hasn't been saved very long. We haven't taught her how to address God. Oh, Father in heaven, Lord Almighty. You know, she didn't know how to do that. She says, hey, God, which is all she knows. But she's praying from the heart. She says, we were halfway through a Bible story. She hasn't finished reading it to me. She, grandma can't read. So Teng On, she depends on Teng On to read the Bible to her. So she was reading this Bible story to me. We were halfway through. We haven't finished yet. She needs to come back now. So in the name of Jesus, Teng On, get up. What are you playing at? And Teng On gets up. The mortician falls down. And Tengor not only has been resurrected, but there's no trace of pneumonia. But she's been dead for three hours. No, she hasn't. Well, physically, yeah, but spiritually, she's been with Jesus for three hours. Following, uh, two days later, it's, it's church on Sunday morning. Tengor walks into church. Oh, what's that? Whoa, what's God doing? Your presence of God is like syrup. They go up to Sunday school, and I'm preaching downstairs, and I'm on fire. I thought, whoa, this is great. You know, the, the anointing, whoa. And, and all of a sudden, one of the Sunday school teachers comes downstairs, and they're crying. So I'm preaching. I don't know what to Whenever I get an impossible situation, there's always one thing I can do. And that is, I said, Margaret, it's for you. <laughs> Margaret, can you sort that out? <laughs> it's great, you know. That's what wives are for. Uh, impossible things that you can't do. They send the wife in. So, so Margaret goes upstairs to see what's going on. And she goes into the Sunday school room and all the kids are crying. And she goes up to one of the kids and she says, what, what's the matter? What, what, do you, what are you all crying for? And the kid just looks at her and, and she says, isn't Jesus beautiful? And in the center, they're all sat around Teng On, and she's just sat there smiling. And the presence of God is there in the room because she spent three hours with Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Isn't that incredible? 
Now, this is, hap- this is things that are happening all the time, but it's not just happening through the, the man of God, the preacher, right? What we've discovered is that every believer is a minister. Amen? Every believer is a minister. And they're ministering in the power and authority of Christ. And whether you're a grandma or a former spirit medium, whether you're a five-year-old, and I could go into uh, people, a guy, a guy who sells vegetables, who's planted more churches than, than I have. And he does it from, from his vegetable truck. How do you plant, well, he plant vegetables, so I suppose it comes naturally, I don't know. But he plants churches from his vegetable truck. In the middle of nowhere, little clearing in the jungle, there's a church there. There might be only 20 people who live in a 10 mile square radius, but eight of them are coming to church. And how is this happening? It's because we've all recognized that we walk in the authority that God has for us. So I could go on and I could go on and on and on. Actually, I was in a place in Kota Kinabalu, it's in East Malaysia, and I was there for the week. And they told me, I said, well, when do you want me to speak? They said, we want me to speak every day. So I said, how long every day? Well, you're speaking from 8 a.m. to 10 p.m. Every day. I said, the whole time? They said, yes. So I spoke for five days. And I still didn't tell all the stories. Hallelujah. So aren't you glad I've stopped now? But I want, to, I want to pray, and it's a simple prayer. It's, a, it's just like this. God, what you've given us, pass on to you. Amen. Right? Freely we've received, freely we give. Amen. Right? Because I'm an ordinary guy. Come on. I'm from Wolverhampton. If you're from Wolverhampton, it's the best place on earth. Okay. But otherwise, oh, it's Wolverhampton. Right? And why would God choose me? I don't know. He chooses donkeys. I was just an available donkey. Hallelujah. But I said yes to God. And that's the choice, right? Very carefully. That's the choice we have. Is to say, yes, I want to be a participator. I want to be a practitioner. Right? I don't want to just come and listen and feel blessed. And then wait until the next week because I need another blessing. But I want to actually be part of the answer. I want to engage in this. And I want to see God do things through my hands. I want to see God do those extraordinary things. We trust you enjoyed this program. For more information on Life Matters and Cornerstone Church, visit our website at www.cornerstonechurch.com. We hold our Sunday services at 10.30 a.m. and 6 p.m. at Sandown Park, Asia, Surrey. We are a family church where all are welcome.